yeah, so my name is Chris Shane. I uh, just moved to here in Dover about six months ago, uh, seven months ago now, uh, with my fiance Sarah over there. And so yeah, we're still getting to know the place. If you got any good restaurant recommendations, let me know after. Um, and so yeah, I am a photographer and filmmaker. Um, primarily I work with outdoor athletes, outdoor brands, uh, and then sort of tourism agencies, that sort of thing. Um, and then I'm not gonna focus on it uh, in this presentation, but I work with a lot of nonprofits down in Boston uh, for a lot of social justice issues. Uh, so you got like homelessness, um, bipolar disorder, uh, substance abuse, all that stuff. Uh, I work with a lot of nonprofits down, down there as well. So uh, without any further ado, uh, we'll just kick it off. Got a, what's that? What it, I lived in Boston for the last 10 years. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, grew up in Maine. And uh, yeah, so now we're back in New Hampshire. Nice, great location to triage, go all over New England from. How's it going, guys? All right, so before I kind of talk about anything else, uh, I figured I would just kind of show you just a three and a half minute video. It's like kind of a time lapse and drone style video that I just put together, sort of just like encapsulates the last two years of stuff that I was able to shoot uh, while kind of in the pandemic and sort of everything kind of slowed down. Um, so I'm very proud of all the work that I shot in this. Um, so here we go. It'll be the next one here. Here we go.
And it's playing on YouTube, so a couple thumbnails there after, so sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so hope you enjoyed that. How's it going? Um, so yeah, that's actually, I it was a primarily a photographer uh, two and a half years ago. And so that video is actually sort of my first foray into learning how to edit video. Uh, so I have since been doing a lot of video as well as part of my work. Um, so that's sort of kind of a cool thing for me to reflect back on. It's sort of like this kind of evolutionary part of my own career where I have started to learn how to do video a little bit better anyways. So um, I figured I would sort of just share a couple of my favorite photographs and tell just a little bit of background and story behind them. Um, so they just mean a lot to me. So first one is... This is my friend, Andrew Drummond, um, who is the owner of Ski the Whites in Jackson, New Hampshire. If you are familiar with Ski the Whites uh, at all, really, really well-known ski shop. Um, and this is on the Great Gulf Wilderness, kind of right looking into the northern presidentials of the White Mountains here in New Hampshire. Uh, this is probably, without a doubt, my favorite photograph I've ever taken. Um, mainly because you might have seen it and noticed it in the video as well, but just to the right of Andrew is literally the most amazing cloud I've ever seen. It looked like a wave, um, and it's gonna be in another video that I'll show later. Uh, so Andrew and I shared this awesome moment together. We skied up the Cog Railway um, at starting at 4 a.m. in the morning and got really, really cold, super windy. Uh, it was actually, um, very icy, to be honest. Uh, so we were slipping and sliding once we got above tree line, and it's all worth it, right? We wake up in the morning for just this amazing sunrise. So that's without a doubt, without a doubt, my favorite photo. This is actually a panorama. So I printed this before. Uh, it's twice as wide. Uh, it just doesn't fit on this type of ratio of a screen. So there you go. Um, this is Mount Katahdin in Maine. And so this was shot, this is actually a single image from a time lapse, which I shared in the video as well uh, for a project I worked uh, with the main office of tourism with. Um, and so I actually got to sleep on the ridge adjacent to Mount Katahdin that night. Uh, don't tell the park that I did that, they would not be happy with that. Um, but yeah, so this was a time lapse that I shot for a project where we actually worked with the state of Maine to produce a film that was about experiencing the night skies uh, in Maine. So uh, one of the time lapses that we wanted to shoot was, of course, the Milky Way uh, right behind the famous knife edge of Mount Katahdin. This photo is not maybe, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I will cover that in a future uh, slide, actually. That's a great question. Um, so this photo is not maybe the most amazing glamorous uh, light or anything like that, but it's actually kind of interesting. It's kind of blown out a little bit. Uh, it was very intense light. This is taken in Oman, uh, and the two silhouettes are my friends, Simon Donato and Jim Mandeli. This is taken uh, on an expedition that I worked on in Oman trying to be basically the first Westerners to do this entire traverse across the Musandam Peninsula, which is a very small section of Oman. Um, and I'll cover that as a broader story uh, in a little bit. Um, but I like this image. This is the last day that we had in our expedition. It was sort of a symbolic moment for the two. They had actually been to Oman twice before to try to complete this. And the second time they've gone, uh, Jim had actually broken his ankle. They had to get airlifted back to Dubai, a whole thing. Um, so it was awesome to be with them as they finished their, their, uh, their attempt. So this is a photo of Tuckerman Ravine. Um, a little bit of a low tide year, if, you're, if I may. Uh, still not a lot of snow. This was shot last January. Um, doesn't look much different right now, uh, which is somewhat sad. Um, but I really love this photo because it sort of just symbolizes it's heinous weather out. It's super cold, it's super windy. There's snow hitting my face everywhere. These are my three friends. That's Andrew, who was in that first photo, uh, as well as his, his uh, other ski buddies, Jake and Chris. And 
they ended up actually starting a ski run that was way up there in the right hand corner um, that looks impossible from the angle that I shot it. Um, and I just like how all the rock structures have these very symbolic leading lines that sort of naturally lead your eye to the subjects. Um, this is probably my second favorite photo. Um, this looks like it's out of Star Wars. It's actually in New Mexico. Uh, it's called Ship Rock. Um, and I think it's one of the most beautiful structures in the world. Um, it's an old volcano. And I knew about Ship Rock, and I just had this idea in my head that it'd be cool to hire a pilot and get a shot from the air. Uh, so I got to do this with my best friend from college. Um, I called the pilot, and he's this really, really nice guy in Farmington, New Mexico. Met us bright and early. And it was a 1977 Cessna, I believe. Definitely didn't look new, that's for sure, but I uh, think he kept it well oiled. Um, and yeah, I just, like, for whatever reason, it's just so cool to see how you have the striations from the volcano um, on the upper right hand corner in the middle, and then you actually have the shadow of the, of the rock structure creating this sort of like talon looking thing. It's super unique. Uh, I've never seen a photo like it. Um, so I think it's uh, just a really, really cool photo to have. So, and last one, um, this is just a very classic Northern Lights shot. Uh, if I'm being honest, I don't like how this was shot, but I think this is really important to share. Um, I was sort of just getting into photography. I was not a professional photographer when I took this photo. Uh, this would have been maybe six years ago, I think, six or seven years ago. Um, and I would have done a lot of things differently now. But uh, the story here is that I traveled to Iceland with two of my friends, sort of an amateur photographer, wanting to get, you know, hopefully get some really cool photos of Iceland. Um, had no Northern Lights sightings for like six or seven days, and that's sort of why you go to Iceland, right? Uh, and so we decided on a whim the last night to take a ferry to the small island, that, which had actually previously been totally ravaged by a volcano. This is part of the volcano, basically. Um, and as we were taking the ferry off to the island, uh, just started seeing in the distance, this faint glimmer of green starting to dance in the sky. Um, and so I just got really, really excited. I was like, oh my God, this is gonna be the night. And so we found this mountain, we found this, this trail on our own. This is before, I think you could zoom in on Google, to be honest. Um, and we climbed all the way up to the top of this and we spent, I don't know, three, four, five hours all night long uh, just watching the Northern Lights just dance in the sky. Uh, I remember distinctly rolling in the grass, uh, just totally freaking out because it was the coolest thing I've ever seen. And um, so, yeah, that's why this photo means a lot to me. It's not maybe the most technical photo, but technically sound photo. Um, but it was the first time I really got to see something just in the natural world that just totally blew me away. All right. So, um, was anybody here into photography or? Yeah, have some. Okay, cool. So, what I want to do is sort of just talk about some photos, uh, photo tips that I might have, um, but do it under the guise of showing some other photos that I've taken, why I think they maybe fit uh, within sort of the tips that I have, um, and then maybe kind of share with a little bit of stories there. And feel free to maybe ask some questions if they're you know super related to the topic that uh, we're in. No problem there. And I'll definitely get you the Star Trails photo, uh, Star Trails question. So. Um, I don't know who said this, it's probably not verbatim at all, but I think it's super pertinent to photography. Um, to learn all the rules of photography and then learn how to break them. Um, because at the end of the day, you're trying to tell a story, right? And so if you're spending a lot of brain power on, am I applying the specific rule to this moment that's happening in front of me? Most likely it's gonna feel rudimentary, it's gonna feel maybe bland, it's not gonna feel like you're really, really in the moment. So. I think learning to be okay with breaking the rules is always, always a good thing. So this is not a pretty slide. Like I definitely saw a lot of these slides in math class and all that stuff, but I think it's super important to just look at really quickly. Um, when you're talking about photography, you have shutter speed, you have aperture, and you have ISO. Those are the three most important things from a technical perspective that you're gonna deal with when you're using your camera. Um, the shutter speed is, how fast the shutter in the camera clicks. 
aperture is how much light your lens will let hit the sensor. And then ISO is the sensitivity of your sensor in that moment when you take a photograph. Um, obviously, ISO would be more related to, uh, if you're in the film days, you have a sensitivity of film um, that's no longer the case with digital cameras, that's sort of what I'm referring to, um, but you're changing that sensitivity within the, within the actual sensor um, that's in the camera, and that's related to ISO there. So that is the exposure triangle. Change any of these three functions, and your picture will look and feel different um, to a marginal degree. What's that? Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so first one, shutter speed. I took this photo a week ago. Uh, that is of Whaleback Lighthouse, uh, not too far from here. Uh, great common park, but down the street, uh, about 30 minute drive, I guess. Um, so shutter speed is, um, this is sort of just a kind of a cover photo for shutter speed, but I think it's kind of important to note, you know, if you're gonna shoot a photograph and it's gonna be really slow shutter speed, say maybe 1 50th of a second or something like that, this is sea smoke. So that was zero degrees outside, it was windy. So all of this sea smoke was blowing across the water. If I shot this at 1 50th of a second, this would probably be really blurry. Um, it wouldn't have that same, uh, also the water sort of in the bottom middle frame there, you probably wouldn't see that reflection and that detail of the reflection in the water. It would be blurry. Um, and so I think that would actually diminish this photograph if that were the case in this, in this moment. So that's sort of what we're talking about when we're talking about shutter speed. So the three things that I think about the most with shutter speed is, showing blur, um, which maybe means to show a pass the passage of time. Um, it could be a star trail photo if you wanted that. Um, maybe it's someone running and you want to actually see them running. You don't want the freeze action. You want to see them kind of blurry. You want to feel like they're in motion in the frame. Um, the second is obviously to freeze action. So if you have a skier, for example, uh, you really want to have a really fast shutter speed so you can feel that they're totally frozen in that moment and you can feel that maybe hit that turn perfectly with this beautiful background. Um, you want to see them frozen and perfectly sharp and in focus in the photo. Um, and then long exposure is you really want to show a, a lot of passage of time. So maybe you want to show clouds passing over a mountain pass or you want to show a river um, moving, rushing really fast. So you maybe you would do a one second or two seconds or maybe even 30 seconds or longer would show how that river is really flowing. Um, so here's just a couple examples. Um, this is motion blur. Um, in my opinion, if uh, my friend here, Kanoa, who lives down the street, uh, were totally tack sharp, frozen in the moment with no motion in this image, I think it would be kind of uninteresting. Uh, in, my, in my opinion. Um, I think by showing him kind of blurry, it shows that he's running really fast, which he was. Um, I actually to kind of counter that. I actually also moved my camera while I was taking the picture to kind of add that extra blur. That's why you see in the foreground, all these rocks are also kind of blurry. It's because I'm literally moving the camera from right to left. Um, it's not everybody's favorite style, but I personally like this kind of stuff. So this would be, fast shutter speed, uh, freezing the action. Um, that's my friend Andrew again. Um, and this is in the Northern Presidentials. That's Mount Washington in the background there. You can see the weather tower uh, at the summit there. Um, obviously a frozen in time moment is super important in this image. If he's blurry, you're not gonna feel like he's hitting that turn perfectly. Um, and so that's why I think when it comes to skiing, or running or um, you know, biking, for example, a lot of times, almost always, you wanna freeze that action. What's that? It'd probably be about 1 800th, I believe, is probably what I, maybe, maybe a little less, because um, that's like, that's about nine in the morning, um, probably. So it was probably 1 500th to 1 800th would be what I'm guessing. Um, How, how do I judge that? How do you adjust that? Oh. Well, um, so within a digital camera now, it's kind of like cheating. Uh, you have a light meter 
in your camera that you can, in a histogram, which will show you, um, which I didn't show in this, but um, it just gets nerdy really fast. But um, basically you can see how much light uh, is being exposed to your camera based on the settings that you've set in your camera. And you can know whether or not you maybe are letting too much light in, or maybe there's, there's not enough light. And so maybe the shadows of the dark parts of the image or the bright parts of the image would be too overexposed. Um, so I can actually see that information in camera. Any digital camera will show that. Um, and so this is a long exposure. Kind of the last thing I wanted to note with shutter speed. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite images. I took this a long time ago. It's probably like eight or nine years ago now. Um, this is from Cannon Mountain, and that is uh, Franconia Ridge uh, in the White Mountains. And there was a storm that was just blowing by, and I think I went up there wanting to maybe do like a you know one or two photos, uh, and then ended up realizing that um, you know the clouds are going to be really really cool. And so this these clouds are moving super fast, so you could see them blowing right over the ridge. Um, so for me, what I did was. Um, put a, a filter on in front of the lens. It's a, probably a 10 stop filter is what I used. Just a darker filter that you would screw on to the lens. Um, and that allows you to just use a longer shutter speed. Um, so this would be, I think 30 seconds probably. So uh, that was shutter speed. So now we're on to aperture. So this is, so there's a lot already, but this is, one of my favorite photos as well. This is one of the more meaningful photos to me. Um, I took this this summer. Um, this is Barry Dana, who is a former uh, Penobscot chief uh, up in Maine. Uh, he lives on Indian Island. And uh, I've been told by several people that he was the most handsome man ever by my grandmother uh, back in the day. And he's also probably could have been a professional athlete had he had access to the resources that, um, you know, non-white people don't have usually, or that, you know, maybe just didn't live in Maine, uh, that too. <laughs> um, so he is an incredible athlete. And so he is, I think, believe 66 years old, and I got to follow him uh, running the 100 mile wilderness in Maine uh, this summer. So aperture wise, this photo means a lot to me because if this photo was, um, if, this, if the background was in focus, then you would lose the drama of being pulled to his face to the, the focus, the seriousness that he has in this image. He's 30 miles into his 100 mile run. He is in like full mode. I had two minutes to take this picture. Uh, I was afraid to even ask him because uh, he was so focused. So I think with Aperture, what you're doing is you're trying to change the depth of field. So this is a shallow depth of field, meaning that the image is in front of me is very, very in, in focus, and the image in the back is very not in focus. Um, and so we're drawing our eyes to a very specific subject in the frame. Um, this is a long slide here, but basically, we talk, when we talk about aperture, we're talking about the lenses that we're using on our lens, on our camera, and how much light we're allowing to hit the sensor um, when we change the aperture. So if we have a really low aperture, uh, so like a lot of common apertures would be like a 2.8 would be the lowest that you can get on a nice lens. Um, that would uh, create more of a like blurry effect. It's going to focus in on a very specific subject in the frame. Um, whereas if you stop down to something like f16, you're going to create more of a broader focus on the image. So that's going to be maybe you're shooting a landscape photo of uh, the mountains. You want to be at maybe f11 or f16 because you really want to show focus on everything that's in the frame. So uh, here's a couple of examples. This is my nephew, Theo. I couldn't help but put him in this photo because he's so, so cute. Um, but this is shot at aperture F1.8, um, and it is tack sharp on his eye. And nothing else in this frame, maybe except maybe one of the buttons or something like that, is in focus. So it's impossible for your eye not to be drawn ex directly to his very exquisite, uh, very like, you know, uh, observant view on just pondering the world, basically, right? Trying to figure out what's happening in the world. Um, you can't not feel that in this image. Um, same kind of thing. This is my friend Sammy. Uh, his left eye, I feel like, is a little bit more sharp than his right eye. And you kind of are sucked into what's happening in his head. You're kind of curious, like, what's happening here? And then it's just enough in focus. In his beard as well, he's got some ice on his beard. It was a very cold morning on Katahdin. 
Um, so I think this image kind of draws you in uh, to just his face. This is a photograph I took in New Zealand a few years ago. Um, this is the famous Wanaka tree. If you go there in the morning, there will be 1,000 people also waiting to look at this, this tree uh, because of Instagram. So very Insta popular for sure. Um, but I shot this at probably F8 or F11 or something like that. So I wanted everything in the frame to somewhat be in focus. All right, ISO. This is my favorite, mostly because it gives me an excuse to talk about photographing the stars night, in the night sky. Uh, so this is a photograph of Comet Neowise. Um, I don't know if you remember, we had the massive comet that was passing by, I believe that was two summers ago now. Uh, that you can see with your naked eye. Um, so this is a photograph of the comet with my fiance Sarah in the kayak. It's kind of hard to see uh, on the projector, but um, ISO is very important when it comes to you photographing the night sky. So the higher the ISO, the more sensitive your sensor is to the light that you expose it to. So when you are shooting in, in the night sky, typically you really, really need to crank your ISO um, so that you can actually bring in the light from the stars that are in the sky. Um, so here's an image from uh, the White Mountains actually that I took, that is a self portrait, that's myself. Uh, and that is the Milky Way. So I didn't wanna really talk about how I'm able to stack these images because it's kind of complicated. There's a lot of software that can do it too, but um, this would actually be a composite of probably 20 photographs that I took. So I would put my, my camera on basically a time-lapse mode and I would tell it to take maybe 30 or 40 photographs. Uh, and this probably would have been a 20 second exposure, ISO 6,400 and maybe 8,000 or something like that, very high ISO. Um, so if you were to look at one image, it looks grainy, it doesn't look that interesting in my view, um, maybe I'm jaded, but what you can do is you can take all of those images and process them in different software. Photoshop, there's thing, uh, programs that you can buy. So we'll actually take all those images and then find a median uh, that will basically reduce that graininess that you might see in the photo and create more of a clear, sharp, less noisy image. Um, and that's sort of what you're seeing here as a result of that. This is kind of an interesting example when it comes to ISO. Uh, so this is sort of, you're actually seeing uh, behind the trees here um, is actually the light pollution from Berlin, New Hampshire, or uh, how do you say it? Is it Berlin? I, I, yeah, uh, you can't say Berlin. Uh, so it is very, very, very uh, impacted by light pollution in, in the northern part of the White Mountains, which is unfortunate because otherwise it would be an amazing night sky experience. Uh, and then you have the tent here in the foreground. So my ISO is actually not that high uh, in this photograph. It's probably only um, maybe 1600 or maybe 3200 or something like that. Very, very uh, low. Um, and then using a lens that has an aperture of F2, which allows me to bring in more light that way. Um, so that's sort of a way that you can kind of combat um, you know, tricky, com got tricky compositions. All right, uh, this is a photograph of the sign in Maine. Um, if you're going into Baxter State Park, uh, where it says keep Maine beautiful, where the northern lights over the knife edge of Katahdin. Uh, definitely really lucky to have this photo. I don't know if anyone's ever been lucky enough to take this photo. Um, it is pure luck in my opinion. Um, but this is another example of ISO where um, this would actually be a composition of two different images where I would do maybe a 30 second exposure of the sign and then maybe a, a, a maybe a, I don't know, a, another 15 second exposure of the sky and then blend them together. Um, and that's because I can't show the keep main sign at a really high ISO um, without it being really, really great. So instead I bring the ISO down and have a really long exposure uh, and then that can kind of bring in light without making it uh, grainy. Uh, another photo of Katahdin, same thing, low ISO because you got the moon in the right hand corner. Um, and uh, yeah, I just love this photo, so I want to put it in there. 
And last one is this is probably ISO 12,800. Uh, this is taken handheld. And this is sort of an opportunity where it's like, you just take advantage of whatever you can, you can get. Uh, this is, these are my two friends as we're climbing uh, Katahdin. And I just wanted this photo. I can't set, put it on a tripod or anything like that. Um, so I just cranked ISO, you live with it. Um, but this is sort of an opportunity, an, a, a great example of what ISO can help you with if you're willing to, you know, crank it up in your, in your photos. All right, last or second to last one, composition. This is some of the best light I've ever seen in the White Mountains as well. Um, it's my friend Hillary running uh, across the uh, Alpine Garden or something, someplace similar to that. So we're just gonna talk about leading lines, rule of thirds, and backlight are sort of the three things that I think are really, really interesting to, or important to think about when you're talking about uh, composition. So put a little grid here. Um, so this is a rule of thirds. So usually what you're thinking about when you're talking about rule of thirds with photography is you want to try to either place the subject within where those lines meet. Uh, so that would obviously be, you know, right here, right there, there, and there. Or you've got these segmented lines, right? You've got the first uh, row, the second row, and the third row. And so for this photo in particular, you have sort of the mountain range fits right up near kind of that first row. You have a sun in the second, and then you have sort of a cloud line in the third. Um, so I think this photo really represents um, one way that can use rule of thirds when you're composing. Um, the other way is obviously to place your subject right where that line, those two lines meet, which would be kind of basically what this photo is. That's my mom standing uh, in this little patch of sunlight. She is placed pretty much directly in that lower thirds uh, dot, which is, I think, draws your eye on almost immediately there. Same thing, so my friend Steph running in the uh, Bonneville Salt Flats. Um, we were lucky enough that it uh, had rained, so there was like three inches of rain sitting on top of the salt, uh, which is literally the coolest thing ever. So if you ever go to Utah, it's worth the two hour drive to go to the Bonneville Salt Flats, especially if it just rained, because um, that is what you're gonna see. Uh, it is not warm in the wintertime, FYI. Another example, leading lines. Um, this is the Pemaquid Lighthouse in Maine. You have these rock formations that kind of just naturally lead your eye right up to the lighthouse, right? So you're always looking for these natural features that might draw you to the actual subject that you maybe want to portray. Um, this is another example. I already showed this photo, but same thing, right? You've got all these different rock features and structures that are sort of naturally leading your eyes to what you, what I really want you to look at, which is these three guys who are braving it in insane conditions. Um, and so I think that makes for a great photo for leading lines. Last one, backlight. Took this photo on Monday, uh, but I think it's kind of a great example of backlight where this sort of shows, um, you know, if the sun is to the left or the right, then it's not really that impressive, but because he's literally blocking the sun, you get these really cool refractions of light that are coming from both sides of him. That's creating this really interesting rim light that's sort of wrapping around his body. It's kind of hard to see uh, on the, on the um, projector, but you kind of have this like glow of like, of light behind him. And that can create a lot of interesting drama. All right, so that's pretty much all I had for photo. You know, I didn't mention your star trails. I can't believe I, I skipped that. Uh, all right, we, so what is your, your question with the star trails? How do you get them or how do you? We, yeah. So if you wanna get star trails, the way that you, there's actually like math that you can look at, but it really depends on what focal length you're using for a lens. So um, a lot of times if you're using like, if you're doing a star photo, maybe you're using a 24 millimeter lens. That's a vaguely, a fairly wide angle lens. Um, if you use a shutter speed of longer than 25 seconds, you will start to introduce uh, star trails. If you use a, say a, an 85 millimeter lens, and, it in this guy. Uh, I don't think you need to shoot more than like five seconds and you'll start to shoot, see the star trails. But it's really cool how focal length will impact how star trails will 
uh, will come to be. Um, I personally have never really liked the, the star trail photos that much. I feel like it's usually distracting, um, but sometimes it works really well if you have like a really cool composition um, where you can kind of like overlay this cool composition with you know these crazy star trails. So that answer your question. Cool. All right. Um, so I just wanted to share like a couple brief stories of some projects that I've worked on in the last like uh, year or so. Um, and I have two videos that I can share and, um, and that's it. Uh, so Beat Monday is a project that I worked on, uh, let's see, it was um, October of this year. And it's a show on outside TV that I was contracted to do photographs for. Um, the hosts are actually my friends. Um, and they have a show where they basically have 64, 64 hours to travel uh, or go have an epic weekend adventure is the goal. It's trying to beat Monday, right? Have the best weekend you can possibly have within 64 hours. But you got to be back in the office at 9 a.m. Um, so I traveled to uh, Orizaba, Mexico with them. And so this is Pico de Orizaba. Um, it is 18,500 feet high. Uh, the funny thing about this trip in particular is that the hosts, Mike and Jason, I actually went here before, and it was literally the first project I ever did as a uh, like professional project. Um, so we climbed that mountain together five years ago and then I was contracted, uh, contracted again to then go to Orizaba again with the same guy. So a little serendipitous. Um, so this story is not about Mike and Jason. It is about this dog that we met on this project. Um, I cannot pronounce his actual name. So we called him Poncho. Now beat Monday for this episode, our goal was to fly to Mexico within arriving within two hours of arriving in Mexico. It was to then drive to the base of Pico de Orizaba and then climb it on Saturday. Then we'd come down the next day and we would then run the entire circumference of the mountain, which is 30 miles on this brand new trail that these two local guides just created. Uh, we were shut down on Saturday. So we had a little bit of a rest day. It was, I got hypothermic. It was, it was a crazy thing. Um, so Sunday we get up bright and early at 2.30 AM, uh, arrive at the trailhead at 3.30 AM and start running. Uh, eight miles in, just as the sun starts to rise, this dog comes out of the woods, starts to follow us. You know, pretty normal in a foreign country. You know, you know, in Mexico, you probably see a lot of stray dogs. Uh, so we thought this guy was very, very friendly and started to run with us. Uh, he kept running with us and kept running with us until we were about uh, 15 miles in and realized that he was following us. Um, and we realized he was leading us, uh, and this is no joke, um, because he ended up being the guide who created this trail's dog. Um, I cannot tell you how or why he found us in the middle of the woods, eight miles into this 30 mile run, uh, and why he was not with his owner, because his owner was not near us at all. In fact, he was on the other side of the mountain. So that I can never answer, and I don't know how he got there. Um, but this dog was the most amazing dog I've ever met. Uh, I fell in love with him instantly. Uh, I took so many selfies of, of me and him. Uh, he, would, he would lay down every time we stopped to look at a map or something like that. He'd start napping. Uh, and then I'd kind of like, you know, ruffle him like, all right, let's go, Poncho. And he'd like start making these gr like groans after we'd start moving again because he was clearly upset that, you know, he, hadn't, he couldn't keep napping. Uh, there was one point where we were very nervous that we were leading a stray dog into his demise because it was freezing rain and 33 degrees and he had no food or water. Uh, and yeah, that's, we found out that he was the guide's dog. So this is Mike on the, in the, in the front and then Jason in the back. Uh, this is a hill that we're climbing at 13,000 feet. Uh, and we were both very, or all very hypoxic at this point. We're about 20 miles in. Um, this is kind of a baby bunny hill uh, and we all looked at each other and we were quite exhausted, I can say the least. Um, so in, in total, it was about 30 miles, 8,000 feet of vertical climbing. And uh, we stayed at an average elevation of about 13,000 feet. Um, and why I think this, these photos here 
in this project is so important. This is Poncho. Um, is really, really cool is that I was contracted to um, to do this project. You know, the production team is shooting video, right? So they're spotting up these different locations uh, around the trail, um, and so they have like three different spots that they'll have their shooters and they'll get the shots they need and they'll fly the drone and they'll do all this stuff to make a TV episode. Uh, but for me uh, to get photographs, there was no way that I could just show up at two different locations and get the photographs that I needed um, to complete this assignment well. So that was sort of this really interesting realization as a photographer to get the shot that I need. Well, I'm gonna have to run the whole thing with them. Um, so that was what I did for this project. Um, ironically, I didn't even put my best photo photos in this slide because I just wanted to show Poncho, uh, so I apologize. Um, Poncho led me to this location. Uh, I'm not making this up. He then posed directly in front of the church in the mountain uh, without saying a word or making a peep. He just stopped right there and looked out the mountain. So um, I don't know, maybe he's like a, a god or something that was a dog after. I, it's just the coolest thing ever. So yeah, and there's a selfie of yeah, he's asleep after finishing the ride so or the run so um yeah there you go poncho all right beyond roads this is the oman project that i worked on i think this was 2018 or 2017 um this was a project that was sponsored by merrill uh where i was able to go with a bunch of the merrill athlete team um, and the goal of this project was to partner with simon donato who was a merrill, merrill athlete and also has this nonprofit called Adventure Science. Uh, and so he is a trained geologist. And so what he likes to do is go out to these really remote, ridiculous places and do science. So he wants to go find dinosaur bones or find uh, you know, ancient ruins, or artifacts, and that stuff. It's such a cool uh, interest and hobby that he has. And so our goal was to go traverse the Musadam Peninsula, which, look at this map. Uh, that's Oman, Saudi Arabia to the left, UAE. And then for whatever reason, somehow Oman made the play of the century and also snagged that little piece of land uh, north of the UAE. Don't know how they got that. Um, but that piece, it's, uh, so it's kind of hard to point, but um, where you see Kassab, uh, all that land to the right of that red line is also part of Oman. And that's the Mus Musandam Peninsula. Uh, Across is the Strait of Hormuz, and then you have Iran uh, right there. So as an American, little ominous feeling, uh, to be honest, uh, this would have been in 2017, so it was still kind of still feeling that residual effect of, you know, you don't want to feel disrespectful or you know, any of that. Um, and this is maybe part of, maybe my favorite thing about being in Oman was seeing these guys in this boat. These guys are Iranian. They had taken that little boat and had started in Iran. And then they have like a consignment or some sort of agreement with Oman and Iran where they can trade with the port city that's in Musandam, uh, in the Musandam Peninsula in Kassab. So these guys uh, boated 17 miles across the open sea uh, to trade. And they also flew the peace sign. So I like to think it's because they thought we were Canadian, not American, but I don't know. I was with a lot of Canadians. So uh, that, that, was, that was what I said for that, that trip. And so this is the Musanam Peninsula. It's insane. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know how a place could look like that and people not know about it. Um, it's, it's an unbelievable, otherworldly place. Um, it's 52 miles about of ridgeline that takes you back into the port city of Kassab. And if you see right down that little uh, right-hand corner, that's, uh, and this is sort of a, a cropped version of the photo because just the ratios, but um, that's a Dow that we slept in for two weeks. It's a double decker and uh, really, really cool. We, we just had a one, one boat captain and they just drive us to our start location. Then they would ride around the ocean and uh, meet us on the other side uh, at the end of the day uh, where we planned to be. Uh, and they would kind of have all our food and we'd sleep on the boat and all that. And then we would get up the next day, start back again. Um, another photo of the ridgeline, just truly amazing, amazing place. And so why we were there is we're looking to do science, right? So we want to, um, this is a place that uh, up to about 1950, uh, the locals used to live up on this step. 
um, due to climate change, lack of water and food. They've since moved to the shores to increase their fishing. Um, and that's sort of the trades uh, on the ocean is sort of really the only way they can have a subsistence type of lifestyle now. Um, and so we wanted to do studies on what sort of like ruins or um, artifacts, um, historical, you know, uh, um, collections that we could find and then do science on them. So record, take pictures, write about them, all that stuff. Um, we were the, another scientist who actually uh, had me use my drone and I would take all of these photos. He'd create this big 3D map that he would submit to um, some big publications. So this is an image of one of these steps and you're actually seeing kind of a town, an old town that would have, you know, by the, demarked by the, the walls there. And then uh, that's actually a grave um, that's sort of in that right hand middle corner there. Um, that's like a thousand gravestones or just rocks that were cut. And really, really amazing place to be kind of standing on, thinking about people maybe used to live here, maybe even just 50 years ago. Uh, it's no longer possible for them. Uh, so that's Gino, very eccentric scientist, Simon in the middle. Um, this is some of the stuff that we were finding, um, you know, old pottery that's maybe 50, 60 years old, uh, but definitely found some things that were maybe 100 or, or maybe 125 years old. Um, and so uh, this is really sort of showing the crux of our trip, uh, sort of the second to last day. Uh, we had to do this massive traverse. This is sort of some of the terrain that we were on, not easy to, uh, to be on, that's for sure. This is probably the actual crux of our hardest day. There's lightning storms in the background. Uh, this is right before we had to set up a giant 200 rep foot rappel. Uh, there was a Nat Geo expedition where folks like Jimmy Chin, Alex Honnold, Hazel Finley, um, a couple other folks that are really famous rock climbers uh, had actually done an expedition to the same mountain uh, a few years before. So it's kind of cool to know that uh, there were some other you know, explorers that had been in this area. And so, yeah, I figured I would just play this video. Um, we'll just share our, uh, our experience in a month. Um, and I did shoot this as well, so uh, for video. Unseen and unspent, known only to the local people. Are there still parts of this world so unexplored today and civilizations remain undiscovered? And if so, could a team of adventurers even make it through this landscape? This is where our journey begins. Science in 2008 for expeditions just like this. We pair adventure athletes with scientists to make discoveries in the planet's last unexplored places. I've had the advantage of adventuring for 40 years of my life, hard adventure, hard racing. I've done an awful lot of stuff. Jim and I first came here in 2010 with another archaeologist. We literally stepped off the computer screen of Google Earth into this. We came here really knowing nothing. We didn't know how many people we were going to get. We didn't even know if the were village was long ago. Last year, the expedition ended with a little bit of an injury, oh. and I broke my left ankle and my left uh, medial malleolus. It's a hard bone to break, and I managed to do that. We've got some major goals on this expedition. The first goal is to continue to document the archaeological sites that we've been finding since back in 2010. The second main goal is to complete the traverse of the Moose Dam. Certainly for Westerners, it's going to be a first. And then the third goal, as always, is to get people through safely and then share what we do with the world. What's different this time being the third time, we've got some new talent on the team. I do have a background in landscape archaeology where we closely relate human behavior to landscapes of the past. 
I'm not only the only female, I'm also the youngest, I'm actually probably half of Jim's age. I used to compete internationally in show jumping and synchronized swimming, and I got into more extreme sports like surfing, climbing, mountain biking, trail running. I'm excited to explore this place. This place is pretty remarkable. These massive mountains that are shooting out of this crystal blue sea, and there's so much climbing to be done, there's so much exploration. It's a good place to just hop on a boat and go and explore. Good. Glad this works. The past projects have been completely self supported. This time, we've got a double decker fishing bow. It might as well be a part of Good living. Time, but it's letting us move very quickly through the mountains. That's one thing that I think we're taking advantage of this year. In the past, with heavy pack, it really slowed us down. We spent the first few days of the trip retracing the route of the past two expeditions, exploring the terrain and examining sites, but inching ever closer to the unknown and the mountain crux which lay ahead. Uh, 23 meters, guys. Right here. Great job. Hands are getting a little beat up. Lacerations on my head and on my legs. The rock here is pretty brutal. I can't imagine anyone living up here. Archaeologist, explorer, he's doing some amazing things all over the world. Seeing him stumble across one of these sites and examine it, I was always trying to sneak little pointers and see how we would approach it. Traditionally in archaeology, we would take a lot of time to map out these sites. And now with the development of drones, we can get very detailed data from it and draw a very nice plan in a minimal amount of time. It's not that long ago that people have left these places, maybe 50, 60 years back. The sites that we came across are mostly relating to irrigation and agriculture. What starts forming here is the climate change history. When we talk to the people in the village, they're saying only 50 years ago, they've been up on the plateau growing crops. Now they're only down at the coast and the villages are on the plateau are deserted. It's due to a lack of rain, it's due to a lack of water. We also have what seems to be a refuge for people from the coastline during ages of piracy. They try to protect themselves from incoming ships that would raid the coastal villages. We were exploring some of these little structures over here. Out of the corner of my eye, found this really cool vessel. That's incredible. The most intact thing that we've found yet on the trip. Little by little, every day revealed a bit more about how people were using this landscape in the past. When we produce these data sets, we then can pass them on to specialists who really understand and can derive the right conclusions from it. I'm excited to explore this place and just seeing it as I'm going. And uh, from what I've seen, it's pretty difficult. I've never seen it originally, and I don't really know what to make of it. This terrain is by far the hardest terrain from a third, fourth class type of trekking that I've ever done. It is so rugged, you cannot put your guard down. If you do, you will trip. Day five was a big mountain traverse. We had no idea what to expect. So many unknowns, we don't know. How comfortable are each person being out there in unknown terrain? If somebody doesn't want to go, they need to pick up. I really feel confident that I can get everyone, regardless of their ability, through this, assuming that that backside doesn't look as bad as it could potentially. The threat of bad weather and an unknown route, and we had party of seven, probably the limit of what I'd be comfortable with being responsible for a trip like this. 
We are seeing new terrain. We had pushed up to that point, but not beyond it. We really didn't have much in the way of data. Navigating was by far the funnest part, but also the most challenging. I felt fairly confident you could navigate and find your way through. Alright, buddy. Yeah, it's really nice coming up here. Especially being led by these experienced guys. As it turned out, I do have a little bit more vertigo than is to my liking. So some of these downward sloping ledges with the huge drop off and the rubble on it were quite challenging psychologically for me. The fear for me was when we were on those night bridges, one loose rock and someone's going to fall and this stuff is just unforgiving. You fall on this stuff, you're going to get seriously injured. That was me. Luckily, the muscle dam has a lot of weaknesses. If you persist long enough, you'll probably find your way through. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. 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 Yeah, that's what I'm trying
Fisher Skis, and then Sierra Nevada Brewing. But we have some of the best beer in the world. And I'm not afraid to say that. Over the past few years, I've really rediscovered skiing in a way through the backcountry that I want to share. We have this world class terrain. I've had some of my best ski days ever here in the White Mountains. And that's something worth showcasing. Backcountry skiing in the White Mountains allows you, allows you just to go. There's already this beautiful network of trails, and then as the winter progresses and your snowpack increases, so does your ability to travel. That's where I'm looking as I start to spread out and find these areas of designated wilderness in the White Mountains that are really attracting me. I want to get out and I want to see these areas in the wintertime that are remote and this incredible skiing. Stuff that no one's ever really shown me. The weather makes the White Mountains, but it's also made me who I am in my resilience and decision making, toughness, motivation, all this stuff, these experiences you keep stacking up. It's a big area up there, and there's so much stuff happening with the weather patterns and the wind and, and snow that you might just stumble upon some of the best skiing of your life, but you need to be out there to experience. Yeah, so ongoing projects. Hopefully we'll get enough snow this year to finish it up. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you everybody for hanging with me and listening to me talk about photography and everything. Um, if you're interested in following along, uh, that's my Instagram handle at Chris M. Shane. And my website is chrismshane.com. Uh, does anybody have any questions or anything like that? I'm happy to answer any chat or if you know after um, we end up everything. What, sorry, what's that? How, uh, it would probably be like, my goal is, it's actually probably a lot shorter, probably like maybe 10 to 20 minutes. I think that's sort of the, the, the framework these, these days. I think just a shorter condensed film, um, is a lot more attractive. Uh, the two hour film, whew, that's a lot of work. <laughs> Haven't done one of those yet, but. Yeah. This must be a real challenge. And where to be, when to shoot, how to, that's got to be a huge, um, yeah. huge challenge. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's definitely a niche uh, for sure, but um, I think it's like the perfect, uh, it's, yeah, if you, you have to love being in those places first. And so like, I think for me, uh, I will sit here and just concoct adventures, just I'm in my head all day about things I'd like to go do. And because I always am thinking like that, um, it means that I, it gives me maybe an advantage in terms of thinking about what might look cool, what angles might look cool. Uh, and then also knowing what kind of fitness I need to have, what type of skill sets I need to have. Um, to go keep, you know, keep up with them. And uh, actually, I actually have recently started a YouTube channel as well, where I'm like on camera more and I actually didn't share any of these projects, but I have actually been in like two films that I produced as well. I did a bike packing trip where we biked the whole coast of Maine and uh, I was sort of like the subject uh, along with my other friend, uh, also named Chris. And so also learning that side of things and being on the camera is a whole different skill set. So I think learning all of those skills help you. Um, but I would always be, prefer to be behind the lens. It's, it's more fun, I think. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, you're really touching on a real sore, sensitive subject that I'm dealing with personally right now, uh, because I happen to have a really, really terrible habit of bringing too many lenses, too many cameras. Um, one of the reasons I will admit that I do that is because um, 
the camera bodies now are so small that uh, I'll start packing lenses and I'll say, oh, I'm going to bring three lenses. But I have three cameras. Uh, so, you know, if I'm going to bring three lenses, why don't I just keep a camera on every lens because they don't take up that, much, that extra space. Um, but the problem is, is that eventually that actually creates more confusion because you're not, you don't have a finite amount of choices that you need to just decide on using. So it's actually something I'm trying to get a lot better at because I'm usually prone to just stuff it all in the bag. Um, but uh, I go through phases. I think like any other photographer might where I've gone through a phase where I only want to use prime lenses. So I want to just want fixed focal lengths. Um, they look better. They're more beautiful in my opinion. And it forces you to move with your camera versus just zooming if you have a zoom lens. Um, but a lot of times, like for what I do, having a zoom lens is always the best choice because like something like that Moussendam project, a zoom lens is of course going to make the most sense because you don't have time to change lenses or, you know, on a cliff somewhere. Um, so a lot of times a zoom lens is what I'm going to lean towards. Um, and then sort of maybe I'll bring one prime lens uh, that's um, a low aperture. So if I need like low light or something like that, uh, and lenses are so small these days too, uh, you can stuff three, four lenses into a pack, no problem. Um, but again, that's the bane of my existence currently. Definitely working on that, uh, trying to trim down the amount of gear I bring with me. So the tripods too, so I'll bring like three tripods and that is not a smart idea. So, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and a lot of times, like, kind of introed with that first video, um, where it's all time lapse stuff. Uh, what I'll do is, you know, I'll decide I'm going to bring three cameras because that's not a smart decision, but I'll decide to, anyways, bring three tripods or two tripods because in my head, I'll think, well, I can put two cameras in two different locations, um, and that means I can get two different time lapses so I can show a scene better uh, if I'm on my own, right? So uh, usually it is actually, I'm actually glad that I do it, uh, but in the moment that I'm hiking up and I have, you know, 60 pounds on my back, that's not fun, but um, yeah, long exposures, super crucial. Um, one thing I will say with cameras now, uh, they have such an in-body stabilization where the sensor has a mechanism that allows the sensor to shift a little bit um, as you're holding it. So you can actually shoot a slower shutter speed and still get a, a, a good image, a sharp image, because that, sta that sensor is stabilized. It's not moving with your hand. Um, so that's a really cool uh, feature. So if you have like water, a lot of times I'll shoot long exposures in water, handheld, um, and they look, they look great. So yeah, pretty cool. Uh, oh, sorry, which one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got to do that trip with Sarah, uh, my fiance, and uh, we did like a two week road trip there. And uh, so she had a lot of patience, uh, definitely, you know, with me doing every morning shooting sunrise somewhere. So uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, compliments to her for that. <laughs> So, yeah, it's a beautiful place. I think one of the tree branches has since broken off the lower tree branch, I believe. Um, I actually think it was like a person that went out there because it's so popular now with influencers and people who just want to take a picture and kind of get that social credit kind of thing, which, um, you know, it's it's everywhere. It's, it is what it is. But um, I think someone actually climbed on it and snapped the tree branch. So which is a bummer. But, you know, what can you do? Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Yeah.